Good morning, HCC family. I'm so glad that you're worshiping with us online today. We're in the middle of a series called Divided Church. And today's message is um, especially close to my heart. And I think today you'll see my heart and what God is doing in my heart, in my life through this message. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the salvation that we have through him. Thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. And I pray today that you would use this message, Lord, first and foremost in my life, and use this message in the hearts and lives of our people as they listen, as as they contemplate. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would drive home the truths that we are talking about today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The unjust killing of George Floyd on May 26th of this year shook me to the core. Like many of you, I watched the video of the last moments of his life over and over again. To see a life taken so callously not only grabbed my heart, but it grabbed the heart of the nation and, quite frankly, it grabbed the heart of the world. We must remember, though, that his death was not a singular event. It's a scene that has been repeated frequently over and over again. It's an indication of a deep-seated problem that desperately needs fixing. Tony Evans made this quote. He said, the simultaneous, or excuse me, simultaneous to our medical pandemic, we're in a cultural pandemic, a de-evolution of our society caused by a spiritual pandemic. We've wandered away from a value system that was established by God for how human beings were to live and act and relate to one another. I grew up in a sheltered environment. I grew up in a stable, middle-class, white home. I thank God for my parents, and I thank God for my background. I went to a segregated high school. As a matter of fact, out of the 400 plus students in my graduating class, there were only one or two students of color, African American or Hispanic. Quite frankly, I don't even know who they were. I was completely sheltered from all of the social issues that were facing our country. They weren't happening where I lived, they happened somewhere else. My first ministry position was at a church in a southern city. It was surrounded by black families, but none of those families came to our church. As a matter of fact, as a young pastor, I was told that I could share the gospel with black people, but I just couldn't invite them to our church. They had their own churches to attend. I say that to share that As a result of my sheltered upbringing, I was immune to the suffering and the injustices that others were experiencing. As a matter of fact, I had come to believe that that their problems were of their own making. Quite frankly, if they would just be like us, their problems would go away and their life would improve. God did two things, though, to change my perspective. The first is this. He sent us to Mexico as missionaries. We went as missionaries when we were young. I think I was 24. Vicky was 25 years old. We were just kids, but for the first time in our life, we were faced with a different culture and a different way of thinking. I saw godly people, people who loved Jesus, experiencing poverty and abuse. They were suffering not because of their own wrongs and to a certain degree not only because of their own sins but because of the wrong decisions and the wickedness and the sin of others. That was life-changing for me. The second thing that God did is he brought us to South Florida in 2005. Coming here has changed our life in so many ways. We've experienced a multicultural environment that is unlike anywhere else we have ever lived. 
Developing relationships and deep friendships with people from other ethnicities has been life-giving for us. But it's also been heartbreaking. I remember speaking with Thomas Miller, who was on our staff for a few years, and Thomas sharing his experiences of being racially profiled, pulled over by the police, handcuffed, simply because he looked suspicious. I'd never experienced anything like that. Nobody that I had ever known had experienced anything like that. I've spoken with African-American mothers who have shared the terror they feel when their teenage sons are out at night. I've spoken with hard-working Latin men and women who live in terror of being deported back to their countries of origin. And I've spoken with the leaders of Hope Women's Center a ministry we support and have personally heard the tragic stories of thousands of babies that lose their lives each year in South Florida. All of those situations have made my soul cry out for justice. God, where is justice? Man, I, let me say this today. We can do better as a country, and we must do better as a church. Tony Evans says, before change can take place in the White House, it must take place in God's house. You see, we as the church are the catalyst for change. We, we are the people of God, indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, and empowered by God to represent and advance His kingdom on earth. Here's what we need more than anything else. We need a fresh glimpse of God, His character and what he desires for his church to be. Here's the first point I want you to see today. It's this. Justice comes from God. We see that in Psalm 89 and verse 14. The psalmist says this, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. The psalmist says that true justice emanates from the person and the character of God. Psalm 89, 14 says that righteousness and justice come from the throne of God. And not only righteousness and justice, but steadfast love and faithfulness as well. He alone is the source of all righteousness and justice. I would define those two words this way. Righteousness is the moral standard of of right and wrong, to which a holy God holds man accountable based on his divine standard. Let me say it again to read through it slowly. Righteousness is the moral standard of right and wrong to which a holy God holds us accountable based on his divine standard. Justice is the equitable and impartial application of God's moral law in society. Catch this today. The, the, this verse is not saying that God is sometimes righteous and at other times he's just. Depending upon the situation, he either exhibits righteousness or justice. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying that those are twin attributes. Righteousness and justice always balance one another. You see, God's character of being just and righteous is seen throughout the Old Testament. Quite frankly, it's seen throughout Scripture. Isaiah 33 and verse 5, The Lord is exalted, for He dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. Jeremiah 9, 24, But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me says the Lord, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You see, although today justice or social justice is defined in many different ways, we must realize that there is no justice apart from God. Justice flows out from Him. Righteousness flows out from Him. Justice comes from God. Here's the second truth I want you to see today. As believers, 
justice should be important to us. Let me show you these, this truth from the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, Jesus says this. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the other. Here, here in Matthew 23, Jesus is giving seven woes or seven condemnations on the actions and the attitudes of the Jewish religious leaders. You see, they observe the, the serial mo- you know, the ceremonial aspects of the law. They gave a tithe of mint and dill and, and cumin. But they failed to observe the weightier aspects of the law. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying in their strictness to the law. that The Pharisees would literally go out to their gardens and where they were growing mint and dill and cumin, they would count every single one of those stalks and they would make sure that they were giving a tenth, one out of every tenth of those stalks back to God. They were meticulous in the details of, a, of obeying the law. But they ignored the weightier matters of the law. <laughs> they gave a tithe of everything. But they didn't show justice. They didn't demonstrate mercy. They didn't exhibit faithfulness. Let me be lovingly blunt this morning. That indictment not only applies to the leaders of Jesus' day, but it applies to many religious people today. We often rigidly apply the demands of the law, but we fail to live out the weightier aspects of the law, like love and justice, and mercy. We want to make sure that everybody's abiding by the law, but we're not loving in the way that we do it. We're not equitable in the way we do it. We don't show mercy as we do it. So today we ask ourselves the question, what does God's justice look like? Here's my prayer for us as a church. My prayer for us as a church is that we will learn to think biblically not just politically. Let me say that again, that we will learn to think biblically, not just politically. God's justice is not owned by one religious group, nor is God's justice owned by one political party. I love the words of Scott Saul. Scott is is, uh, one of the leading voices in, in conservative evangelicalism. He's the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church, and he says this, neither right nor left has a corner on truth, justice, or neighbor love. Both have some blood on their hands and imperfectly align with some aspects of Christ's own agenda. Follow the whole Christ, and you will find it impossible to align wholesale with any political party. You see, I'd remind you that we are followers of Jesus first before we're members of a political party or before we vote. So for the follower of Jesus, what does justice look like? We must filter everything that happens through the filter of God's Word. What does justice look like for God? Let me give you a couple of practical applications. The first is this. Justice recognizes that life comes from God. Psalm 139 and verse 13, the psalmist says this, You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You see, God was the one who formed your inward parts. God intricately formed you and created you in your mother's womb. The word knitted has the idea that God put all of our parts together just as one who weaves a cloth. The word has the idea of creating, perfecting, and protecting. That's what God does to the baby in the womb of the mother. The Bible clearly teaches that life begins at conception, not at birth. Thus, abortion murders a person who has been given life by their creator and kills a person who is being formed by God. Let me say this, God is pro-life. But I would add, 
that God has a whole life agenda. You see, being pro-life is much more than just voting pro-life. To vote pro-life and then not be concerned about a child's life after he or she is born does not reflect the heart of God. We've been, we've been really good at, at voting for what we believe. And as a church, quite frankly, we're not very good at putting in practice the principles behind what we believe. You see, from the womb to the tomb, life is important to God. Not just before that baby is born, but for the entire life of that individual. Life is important to God. God not only cherishes the baby in the womb, but he also loves the hundreds of children who were in foster care. He longs to help and to guide many boys and girls whose parents are in prison in Broward County. Do you know today that there are hundreds of children whose parents are in prison in Broward County? His heart is broken for the children of Haiti and around the world who go to bed hungry each night. Let me ask you, what would happen if we as a church had a whole life agenda? We weren't just concerned about the baby in the womb, but we were concerned about the life of the individual all the way up until the tomb, all the way up until God takes them home. You see, justice recognizes that life, all of life, comes from God. Justice also recognizes that everyone is made in God's image. Genesis 127 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. In Genesis 1, God crowns his creation with the formation of man and woman. He gives humans his own image. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 126, he said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You see, from the very beginning of creation, it's clear that as human beings, we reflect the image of God. A truth is referred to by theologians as the Imago Dei. It's foundational in our understanding of how and why God created us. We were created to be His image and to be stewards of all of creation. But there's another aspect of that. The Imago Dei is the foundation for interpersonal relationships. We must realize that every person, regardless of ethnicity, skin color, social standing, financial position, and even past mistakes, every person is created in God's image. So what does that mean for us? It means a couple of things. It means that every person is loved by God. Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, Jesus quotes his accusers as contemptibly calling him a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors and sinners were the most despicable kind of sinners in that culture. The statement was made by his accusers to be derogatory, but it was actually complimentary. They weren't cutting Jesus down, they were actually complimenting his character. You see, Jesus had a way of making everyone, no matter who they were, what they had done, or how sinful they were, feel comfortable around him. Luke 15.1 says, Now tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Why is that? He didn't make them feel unwelcome. He didn't shun them. He loved them. (laughs) What if we as a church? What if we as the church acted that way? What if we loved and cared for our Muslim neighbors? What if we made friends with our homosexual neighbors? What if we treated the homeless man on the corner as if he or she was valued and respected? What if we had a heart for those who are in our country illegally. Who knows, just maybe God allowed them to come to our country to hear the truth of the gospel. What if we, like Jesus, were loving to the unlovable? One of our deacons sent me a song yesterday that ties in so perfectly with this. It's a song by Michael West 
called Truth Be Told. Here's the words, or part of the words. It says, there's a sign on the door that says, come as you are. But I doubt it, because if we lived it was true, or if we lived like it was true, every Sunday morning or every Sunday morning pew would be crowded. But didn't you say the church should look more like a hospital, a safe place for the sick, the sinner and the scarred, and prodigals like me? That's what the church should look like. If our community, everybody out there realized that it doesn't matter what they were, what they did, but they are loved and they were welcomed, wouldn't all of our seats be filled, maybe not during the pandemic, but wouldn't all of our seats be filled of people longing to be loved and cared for like that? You see, the the simple fact that everyone is made in God's image realizes or means that every person is loved by God and every person should be loved by us. Here's the second truth. Every person must be treated with dignity and respect. I know that that, that statement seems, seems glaringly conspicuous and fundamentally obvious, but in practice, it's proven difficult for people to accept and practice. Quite frankly, it's proven difficult for the church to accept and practice. As a nation, we have historically treated our African American brothers and sisters with disregard, disdain, and even hatred. Slavery has left a black mark on our nation. The fact that many African Americans and other minorities were treated as property with no individual freedoms is repugnant. Yet that's a part of our history. Even as the abolition, or even after the abolition of slavery, many blacks were treated as chattel, and then later as second-class citizens. Let me be crystal clear today. Racism in any form, in any manner, is sin. It's not just a moral wrong. It's not just something we have to create. It is sin, and it offends a holy and righteous and just God. You see, racism is the antithesis of God's design found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. And by the way, let's not pretend that the church, the big C church, has not been complicit in this. It's been complicit in the racism that's existed in our country. The Southern Baptist Convention, a group to which we belong today, was formed as a protest to the Northern Baptist Convention's position that slavery was sinful. The church stood silently as Jim Crow laws were enacted in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Leading evangelicals have supported segregation, even as I read this week, calling Jesus the original segregationalist. How unbiblical. I mean, just as my testimony, how how we couldn't even baptize black converts or allow them to attend our church. It's a part of the history of the church. It's a sad part of the history of the church. Even those not demonstrating overt racial attitudes and actions often fail, which is my case, often fail to empathize with the suffering and the pain of our black brothers and sisters. It's their problem. It's not ours, we've said. And we've said that far too long. It's time for us as a church to take a stand and say that's not right. We must do better as a church. To our black brothers and sisters, we want you to know that we love you. We value you. You. We stand with you, and we want you to know that your lives matter to us because your lives matter to God. Every person has been created in God's image and is worthy of being loved and is worthy of being valued and respected. So church, where do we go from here? How do we do better Let me give you three practical points. The first is this. Learn to listen. It's that simple. Learn to listen. James says in James chapter 1 and verse 19, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow 
to anger. One of the best things I have ever done is sit down with people different than me and listen to their experiences, listen to their hurts, listen to their opinions, how they view things that are taking place. It has been educational and it has been life-giving for me. You've never done that. I'd encourage you to walk across the street and knock on the door of a neighbor of a different ethnicity and just sit down and get to know them. Hear their heart. Listen to their story. Listen to their feelings and their opinions. You think that when Jesus met with all those tax collectors and sinners that he just preached to them the entire time, I guarantee you he listened to them, he loved them. They felt welcome enough around him to, be ga- to gather around him and to be drawn to him. Learn to listen. Here's the second thing. Learn to lament. The word lament means to empathize, to feel the suffering of others. Jesus had a heart for those who were suffering. In John eleven thirty five, 35, after seeing the grief of Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus, the Bible says that Jesus wept. Did you ever think about that verse? He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that he had power over death. Why would Jesus weep? Because he, em- he empathized with the grief of Mary and Martha. One of his greatest traits is that he was able to empathize with the suffering of others. Here's a couple of verses, Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Jesus said, come to me, all who are laboring or heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I love this phrase, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Here's Jesus empathizing, sympathizing, feeling the grief of those around him saying, come to me, suffer with me, and let me carry your suffering. But church, what if we did that? Rather than standing up and, 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 and feeling like we have to defend our race or our political views, what if we just listen to people? and grieved with them, and hurt with them. Paul tells us in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. We need to learn to weep. We need to learn to grieve with those who are grieving, not judge them, not condemn them, but grieve with them. Learn to lament. And the last thing is learn to love. Not just love those who look like you, act like you, and think like you, but learn to love those who are completely different than you. Matthew 5, 43 and 48 says this, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He goes on to say, anybody can love those who act like them, think like them, talk like them. But it's the mature, he says. It's the perfect who learn to love those who are different than them, even those who oppose them. Well, church, let's learn to love. Let's learn to be the heart and the hands of Jesus in our community. You see, what's going to reach our community for the gospel is not how they find or when they find out how we voted, but if they know that we love them, that we care for them, that we will treat them as valued human beings and give them the respect that they deserve as creatures, as people who have been created in God's image, that's how we will reach them. Christ. You see, before change can ever take place in the White House, it's got to take place in God's house. Church, we are the catalyst for change. We are the people of God, indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, empowered by God to represent and advance 
his kingdom on earth. Let's be reminded that we are subjects of his kingdom and our loyalty is to him. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of these words. Use them in our hearts and our minds. God, start with me. May each and every one of us, Lord, begin to apply this individually to our lives. And as we apply it individually, help us to apply it corporately and help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.